Welcome to everyone watching. Uh, we're going to give just a few more moments for folks to join this live stream, and we will start shortly. Welcome to everyone. Melissa and Keith, if you're ready to start, um, you can unmute yourself and say hello to everyone virtually. And um, I'll get started by introducing this conversation and sharing a little bit about the both of you. Hi, Melissa. Hi. <laughs> hey, I'm Hi. here, Keith. Hey, Keith. Hey. Wonderful. Okay, I think we're good. That's like the most important thing is just getting on and <laughs> syncing to the Zoom, syncing to the YouTube. So we're with the people. Wonderful. So good evening to everyone who's uh, joining us virtually. We're really excited to have you with us. My name is Naja Zigby Johnson, and I'm coming to you live from Harlem, New York, where I live and work as the Director of Institutional Advancement at the Shabazz Center. We are a memorial, a cultural, and an educational institute uh, dedicated to advancing the legacies of our namesake, Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz. Welcome to tonight's discussion, where we will be exploring uh, author and political commentator Keith Boykin's most recent release, Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America, in conversation with the brilliant multi-hyphenate Melissa Harris-Perry. The Shabbat Center is especially committed to fostering generative dialogue uh, and action grounded in bringing about true equity and sovereignty. So for us, learning and building alongside progressive and radical political voices who can help situate um, our national political landscape is really more important than ever as we collectively build our way forward. So I'll share Melissa and Keith's bios, um, and then I'll pass it over to the both of you to uh, lead this really exciting discussion. And if there's time at the end, uh, we encourage those watching uh, to share questions, um, and we'll make sure to get to those. So I'll start with uh, your bio, bio, Professor Melissa Harris-Perry. Um, Professor Melissa Harris-Perry is the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair in the Department of Politics and International Affairs, the Department of Women and Gender Studies, and the Program in Environment and Sustainability at Wake Forest University. There, she teaches courses on American politics at the intersections of race, place, and gender. She is the author of the award-winning Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, and Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. Harris Perry, Harris Perry currently serves as interim host of The Takeaway, a daily news and information program produced by WNYC Studios. Professor Harris Perry is also the founder and president of the Anna Julia Cooper Center, whose mission is to advance justice through intersectional scholarship and action. From 2012 to 2016, she hosted the television, television show, Melissa Harris Perry on weekend mornings on MSNBC and was awarded the Hillman Prize for Broadcast Journalism. She has served as editor at large for L.com and for Zora. She continues to serve as contributing editor of The Nation. Harris Perry received her bachelor's degree from Wake Forest University and her PhD in political science from Duke University. She also studied theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Harris Perry previously served on the faculty of the University of Chicago, Princeton University, and Tulane University. Thank you for being here with us tonight, Ms. Perry. Keith Boykin is a CNN political commentator, New York Times bestselling author, and a former White House aide to President Bill Clinton. Boykin teaches at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University in New York, and previously taught at American University in Washington, DC. He is a co-founder and first board president of the National Black Justice Coalition. 
He was a co-host of the BET Network's talk show, My Two Cents, starred on the Showtime reality te television series, American Candidate, and was an associate producer of the film Dirty Laundry. And he has appeared on many other TV shows, including BET's Being Mary Jane. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, Boykin is a Lambda Literary Award-winning author of four books. Most recently, Boykin published Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America, which you will explore here tonight in conversation with Melissa Harris-Perry. Thank you, Keith. Now I'll turn it over to the both of you for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we appreciate um, this is an opportunity to have a conversation. Keith, I know that you have been talking about this book all over the place because I've been spending a little bit of time watching some of your other interviews. I hope to not ask you just all the same questions. Um, yes. But you know, there's this thing, right? You write a book, it takes a little while, it finally is out, then you walk around and talk about it. Are you still feeling excited about the book? I am because, um, you know, I. I, I, every now and then I go back and I, I look at the book myself. I, I open it up. I read a few words here and there, or I think about something. I say, "Did I say that? Did I? Did I not say that?" Sometimes I go look, listen to the audio book, which I've never done an audio book before, uh, and I have also the uh, ebook e version too. So occasionally, if I'm trying to find something in the book, I just look on the ebook and do the search function. So. Um, it's kind of cool because this is the first time I could, I could actually access my book in three different platforms. So uh, it's I still feel excited about it. Good, because I definitely feel excited about it. And I actually want to start in the middle and then I want to go to the front and then to the back. But I want to start in the middle because I want to start in 1993. Um, I feel like I've known you, you know, here and there, we, you've, you know, we've constantly been together in media settings. We actually spent a little time together at a bar this past weekend. <laughs> so, so I feel like I've known you in a lot of settings, but <laughs> it's true. We did. That's, there were a lot of other people there too, uh, including my husband. Yeah. Um, but, but this is not a story that I knew. Um, and you're telling the story of, um, working in the Clinton White House, of being um, among the first um, and highest ranking uh, queer members of the kind of inner circle. And then you tell this story about the FBI that I had never, I just hadn't particularly heard you tell before. Can you recount that? Wow. You're the first person to ask me about that. Um, wow. That was, that was a, a weird experience. I got an offer to work for the Clinton administration in the White House. I started working in the White House. I assumed that I had already passed the security check. And then after a few weeks of working in the White House, I get a call from the FBI. I think it was Agent Gary Aldrich. I'm not 100% sure. And the reason why I mentioned that is because he, he became this conservative anti-Obama person who wrote books about Obama. Um, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was he. And um, he called, called me into his office and closed the door and, and said to me, so we have reason to believe that you may be leading an alternative lifestyle. And I was shocked by this. And I, I was like, alternative to what? I said to him, knowing exactly what he meant. But uh, I wanted him to say it. And then he said, well, we have reason to believe that you might be homosexual or gay. And I was shocked because um, I thought that was public information. I'd been out for several years at that point and been in the newspapers. And I told him that he was a little shocked that it was in the newspapers. And I wondered why is the FBI bothering to even ask questions like this or investigate something like this in the 1990s? I thought those issues were already resolved, but clearly I was wrong because in previous administrations, it had, it had been a bar to actually service. So um, it was just a reminder of how I sort of found myself on the cusp of change unknowingly and just kind of uh, walking into the situation blindly thinking that things had already changed when there was still much more work to be done. I feel like where you just ended um, that sort of insight is, is precisely at the core of the book itself, right? That we here we are um, in these moments thinking, oh, we already took care of that, right? Like yes. that's that's been taken care of. Not that any, not that any thinking person who I know ever imagined that the Obama year has constituted a post-racial moment. But I I I will say that even I suspected that we were 
at least in a period where the open embrace, the kind of joyful, um, gleeful excitement about white supremacy, I did think that was in the past and not so much. Hmm. Well, I thought so too, actually. I, I thought that racism was still going to be a persistent part of our country's uh, society for for a long, long time. But I, I expected that at least by the Obama era, that that, would, that had been pushed so far underground that those people wouldn't be given a public voice. Um, what I didn't anticipate, and I should have, is that the Obama era itself uh, helped to generate this, this backlash and helped to create this uh, public uh, expression of racism and xenophobia and bigotry that had been hidden for decades. So uh, Obama brought that out. And the first person to do that, the vehicle to, to uh, sort of deliver that message, of course, was Donald Trump, which he did starting in 2011, I believe, when he launched his campaign challenging Barack Obama's birth certificate. Yeah, you know, I so remember um, being in cable news at that time and the sense that it was that it was funny, that it was a joke, that it was so obviously appalling that um, that it was okay to cover it because uh, covering it would only right demonstrate how ridiculous it was. Um, but but even then, I felt a certain discomfort about it that that our coverage of it also amplified it. You're right. I remember watching one of his press conferences at an airport hangar um, where Trump, who is then just a private citizen, literally stood at this hangar talking to the press on live national television. It was definitely on CNN. I don't know if it was on MSNBC, but definitely stood there talking on live national television, just spewing out conspiracy theories about the president of the United States. And it was covered without any filter. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. And the assumption was that most people would be able to see how ridiculous it was. But the fact that he was getting live coverage to say this helped enable and empower those people who believe those very things. And that was just the beginning of the process of Donald Trump emboldening uh, the people who had lived in the closets for the past few decades to the point where we end up with an insurrection this year because those people felt empowered to do so. So let's let's in that moment of you bringing up the insurrection, let's go back to the start of the book because it starts in a most fascinating way. <laughs> it starts uh, it starts with you talking about um, your claustrophobia, but discovering or not discovering, but already knowing that you were claustrophobic, but experiencing it in a very particular setting. Again, maybe for folks who haven't read the book yet, if you want to tell us a little bit about that start of this book. Right. Well, the book begins, um, ironically enough, since it's a book about the darkening of America, it actually be begins in Mexico City. Uh, uh, and the first moment of New Year's Day um, in on January 1st, 2020. And I'm, I find myself in a former women's prison in Mexico City, uh, which is someplace I had not expected to be, but I was there for this New Year's Eve party that was unusual. And I was in a hallway. I wasn't actually in the party. I was trying, you know how you're rushing to get to a New Year's Eve spot so you can all celebrate? I wasn't actually in the party. I was in a hallway trying to get into the party. It just felt kind of a bizarre place to begin the year. Um, and then um, the next day, on New, well, the, actually that same day on New Year's Day, I go with my friends to this thing called a Temescal, which is a heat lodge. I've never seen it before, an igloo-shaped heat lodge that's very popular in, in some places in Mexico. Um, and it's basically a sweat, sweat lodge where you have to crawl into this thing uh, and it's very dark and very hot and they close the door and you can't see, you can't hear, you can hear, but you can't really feel anything. You just, except for the heat, you can't, you can't really appreciate all your senses. And, um, I started to panic. I started to think, oh my gosh, I can't stay here for 45 minutes. I have to get out of here. Um, and so I stayed for a couple of minutes and I rest, rushed out <laughs> because I, I was, my claustrophobia got the best of me. And then the the uh, the shaman who was presiding over the ceremony walked out a few minutes later and talked to me and talked me into coming back in, and 
he convinced me to put my hand on the door as sort of a technique to, to feel safe and comfortable. And by doing that, I was able to return for the remainder of the ceremony. Now, the reason why I started the book that way, it seems kind of odd, but it was actually an important moment for me because I would find that sort of sense of comfort necessary later in the year when I found myself arrested for the first time in my life uh, as I was covering a, a protest a few days after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, and I was locked in a police van and I thought immediately, I'm gonna die here. I thought about Freddie Gray. I thought I'm gonna I thought I'm gonna have a panic attack. I thought I was gonna faint, I thought I was gonna pass out. It was really hot. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And my arms were tied behind my back the whole time. But for some reason, I found this inner strength and calm that I had not expected I would have. Uh, and I remember that moment in Mexico and it brought me the peace I needed to survive that ordeal. I have to tell you, Keith, that um, as you were beginning at first to, to write the story in um, in the text about, you know, oh, I'm going to need this, you know, technique. And you're saying, oh, you know, the claustrophobia was getting to me, but I, I knew I'd, you know, or later in the year that you were going to use it. And I thought, oh, this is about quarantine, right? The feeling that so many of us had about being in quarantine. And, and I thought, okay, that's an interesting kind of metaphor to, to help. But when I then got to the part about the arrest, I have to say, I'm not particularly claustrophobic, but my anxiety for you, now I had just seen you, obviously you'd written the book, I knew you were right. fine. <laughs> and right. My anxiety was um, ticking up at every second about the level of vulnerability, like what your body just becomes this disposable black body in this space. Um, there's, no, there's no escape from saying, oh, I'm special, I'm important, I'm on TV, I used to work for the White House. No, like, you know, you're a black guy who is arrested at a protest with his hands behind his back. And, and again, when you made the point about Freddie Gray. Um, so I just wanted to, to say in part how much I appreciated um, you letting us into that um, level of like the embodied experience of vulnerability and oppression. Thank you. I. Um... You know, I, I think sometimes uh, as men, we don't often express our vulnerability. Um, and so um, I'm vulnerable just like anyone else. And I felt it was important for me to share that story because it was honestly uh, somewhat of a terrifying experience. I don't even think I captured the terrifyingness of it for myself uh, in the book. Uh, but in hindsight, it seems like, oh yeah, of course I survived that. But at the moment, I'd actually dreaded being arrested my entire life. I've been covering protests for years, going back to my college days. I've been on the front lines. I've been behind police lines, in front of police lines. I was tear gassed in Ferguson and never, ever got arrested. Uh, Cause I just, I, I'm always with the press. I always figured I'm never gonna get arrested. So when, when the moment came, I actually was really, really uh, scared thinking, oh my God, I hope I don't pass out. That was the thing that kept coming to my mind. I hope I don't pass out. Cause I had done that several times before under less stressful circumstances, but fortunately I was able to make it through the, the ordeal. Yeah, and I, I think it's worth pointing out that being arrested and, and knowing, you know, that the police actually aren't there to serve you. If, you know, if it ought to be the safest place in the world to pass out is if you are with, um, you know, your, your tax, you know, paid um, police officers who are there to protect and serve you. But of course we know um, that that's not a safe place, right? To become. Well, and, and you know, the thing that really got me too, this was a few days after George Floyd was murdered. And it wasn't until a few months later that I actually saw the George Floyd video. And one of the things that was so eerie to me is that George Floyd repeatedly protested to the police that he has claustrophobia. He didn't want to get into that police car in the back of the police car because he has claustrophobia. And I felt his pain. And I, I can imagine maybe the police officers didn't believe him, but I understood what that's like. And I had the same sort of fear of just being trapped in this police van by myself. So um, it, it reminded me how important it is to be sensitive and compassionate to what people are going through, which is clearly what the four officers uh, who killed George Floyd were unable to do, to humanize him and put, him, put themselves in his shoes. So I wanna talk a little bit about politics, because I do love the book. 
in part for just not even being dishy on politics, but for being, uh, for giving us that insider view we don't always get. Um, and here's one of my favorite moments. Um, it is you as a young person meeting a very young Donna Brazil. Oh, um, wow. This is just, I love this. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna read just a little bit. So you, you, you write, um, when I first met Donna in Iowa, I was intimidated by her imposing stature and her reputation. At only 28 years old, she was a political prodigy who'd already worked in senior staff positions in three presidential campaigns. And then you go on to say, she also talked to white people in power the way I wanted to and the way I someday would, but not yet. Um, there is nothing I don't love about that insight in part because I am a, I'm a big Donna Brazil fan, whatever. <laughs> human foibles she has she's just great but that that she she talks to people in power in mm. a way we all wish we could yeah that was really uh, remarkable for me because she was not too much older than i was at the time but she had this big senior job in in the white house i had a low level job i mean excuse me in, in the campaign staff i had a low level job with the campaign staff i was a uh, governor dukakis's press aide so my job was to travel with the candidate everywhere and essentially do two things one because i spoke spanish i was i was supposed to sit in on all of his spanish language interviews and translate them for the press secretary and two, I was supposed to bring something called a malt box to all the different events so that the, the reporters could get uh, access to the audio feed. That was really all I had to do. Uh, but I had to travel all across the country uh, with the candidate every day. So I got a chance to see him. And here was Donna Brazil as a senior campaign advisor, national field director who'd worked in the Jesse Jackson campaign. She seemed sort of larger than life to me, uh, that she was respected and willing to say things that other people wouldn't say. And the day when she lost her job was the day when she said two things. One, she mentioned uh, a question about George H.W. Bush's inter, uh, alleged extramarital uh, relationships. And two, she talked about Willie Horton. And that was the beginning of the discussion about the racism at the heart of the George Bush campaign. Uh, because it had been sort of swept under the rug and Donna brought it out into the open. And even though she lost her job because of that incident, it was an important moment to me about speaking truth to power. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't something that I saw myself as being able to do at that time, but watching Donna empowered me to be able to do that later in my own life. And I so appreciate even just that you remind us that it was Donna Brazil who brought that moment to the fore, that the use of racism in political campaigns is like, oh, today's Wednesday. But by 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 highlighting it, by forefronting it, by by confronting it, she actually changes the entire way that we even understand how American political campaigns operate. Absolutely. You can't think about the 1988 campaign without talking about Willie Horton. And that is largely because of Donna Brazil. And um, even though, as I said, even though she lost her job, I thought at that point, you know, this is a bad moment for Donna, but she's going to be okay. She's a very talented person. And she, she ends up becoming the chair of the Democratic National Committee. How about that? Yeah, Donna's okay. She's, right, she's going to exactly. work it out. <laughs> right. Um, this is just a small point, but at one point in the text you write, as a young kid with a big greasy jerry curl. Um, Keith, are there pictures? <laughs> I'm sure there are. Oh my God, my mom mentioned that same quote to me just yesterday. She quoted, she said she was laughing when she saw that. Yeah, that, that was when I was work, working in the uh, 1982 campaign. I can't believe it's that old. But from uh, this, this candidate from 19, 1982, and I was running around Clearwater, Florida, uh, trying to get people, white people to vote for this liberal Democrat. But yeah, I had a big jerry curl back in the, in the 80s. And um, I didn't even realize that was an unusual thing because I lived in Clearwater, Florida. That's what everybody did there. And my dad was- a, It is still what everyone does there. This is true. <laughs> this is true. My, and my father went, was the owner of a beauty supply company. So we had unlimited Stay Soft Pro and Carefree Curl products and everything you wanted. Uh, so I, my curl was always, always moist, always <laughs> moist. 
Always, need, always moist. I need photos. I really. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually embarrassing. When I get to Look, college and I'm, I'm assuming it's it's a cool thing to have a jerry curl, you know, and I realize I'm the only one with a jerry curl. Everybody else does not have that. So. Oh, my God. Did people sing soul glow to you? Like <laughs> <laughs> nobody, you know, nobody ever said anything to me about it until after I graduated. Like years later, people told me how they would make fun of me. But I had no idea the whole time I was in college. Oh, look at Dartmouth. What a nice and, and polite. <laughs> was. <laughs> All right. One of the things that I love about that whole section from, you know, from your little kid self with the big Jerry curl through meeting Donna Brazil, even through finding yourself in the White House with Bill Clinton, is there still a certain kind of like wide eyed enthusiasm about the American democratic and electoral process? Mm. Do you still have that after what the world is and all the things that you've seen? No, that's a great observation. Um, uh, I'm sort of approaching it from two points. One, I don't have that enthusiasm. I, I, I have a whole chapter in the book called Barack Obama's Unre Unreciprocated Optimism because I think Obama seems to have that and I don't understand why. But the other point, which is completely kind of unexpected is that when I wrote the book, actually when I wrote the proposal for the book, the publisher came back with this cover, which I had nothing to do with, by the way. And I loved it, except for the fact the title and the subtitle are upside down, which I don't like, but, but I loved it. And the reason, part of the reason why I loved it, because it reminds me of this young person sort of looking at America as it's changing. And I, I kind of see myself in the eyes of this young person 20, 30 years ago, looking at America as it's changing. And then um, having that sense of hope and optimism. And here we are today in 2021, where we don't quite have that same sort of sense of, of faith in the country. In fact, I'm actually, I don't want to say pessimistic, but I'm actually um, at the point where I feel like we're at a crossroads. Uh, I think like we're, I say this in the book that we're in a cold civil war, but I really think the country could go either way. And I, I think we could easily find ourselves in a real civil war or a dissolved country, the end of the union uh, within, the, within the next decade. Um, I don't see that as being impl implausible at all. And it all depends on what we do right now. So I, um, as I was reading the kind of unrequited love story of um, of you and, and President Obama, and it's actually the the unrequited love is relative to the country, right? So it's not that um, that he loved you, but you did not his campaign or the other way, but rather that he, you know, he seems to love an America that doesn't um, that doesn't love him back, at least not in the. I mean, the man did get to be president for two terms, so it's not that it completely hates him, <laughs> but uh, you know, just to be clear. Uh, not in the ways, for example, that it seems to hate Freddie Gray and um, George Floyd. But it's funny, I still felt that during the Obama years. I maybe even still felt it at the end of the Trump years. But I think I noticed how much I didn't quite have that optimism anymore in the summer of 2020 as the second wave of the Black Lives Matter movement was really taking hold. And so many of the students who I teach kept saying, this is it. This is the reckoning. This is the moment. This is when it's all going to be different. And I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, probably not. Like, you know, this is good. I'm glad y'all are doing this. You know, every generation should. So here's the question, Keith. Do you think it is life cycle? Like, in other words, do you think that it's like we hit about a certain age, we've done mm -hmm. a certain number of decades of the work, and then you know, we kind of get that Du Boisian, um, you know, time to go to Ghana, <laughs> I've right. done what I can for America. Um, right. Or do you think we're actually reflecting accurately on the social and political circumstances we find ourselves in? Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like the situation we are in right now is, is different. I won't say it's unprecedented because I'm sure it's happened before in our country's history, but unprecedented in my at least lifetime. Um, I don't think I've ever seen our country as divided as it is in my adult lifetime. Um, I'm sure certainly it was in the, in the 60s with the civil rights movement, in the early 70s with Vietnam, but my adult life, I've never seen this country as divided as it is. And I think that the genie is out of the bottle. 
I don't know how you put that back in when you have 74 million people voting for Donald Trump after four years of racism and bigotry. I don't know how you put that back in after hundreds of people stormed the US Capitol and try to stop the counting of votes to undermine the democratic election. You know, I don't know how you put that back in when people have been emboldened to deny history and, and to use every tool at their disposal to prevent black and brown people from becoming a part of this new emerging majority. So I think conflict is inevitable. The question is, what are we gonna do with it this time? And one of the arguments I try to make in the book is that we keep going through these cycles that you're talking about, but we keep creating these moments of, I'll say truces. I don't know if that's, if you can make mm. if truces is a plural mm. of truce, uh, but we keep coming to a truce moment instead of negotiating a real peace treaty where everyone actually um, can sort of resolve our differences and agreement. We just have a truce where we decide we're gonna have what Dr. King would call negative peace, the absence of conflict instead of a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. So we're, we are, I think, in another moment right now where I think Joe Biden's administration is that negotiated compromise. It's like, we're going to give you the Biden years for four years or however many years he may be in office to calm you down after all the, 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 the wild behavior of the previous administration. But um, those issues haven't been resolved. Structural racism hasn't been resolved. Systemic racial disparities haven't been resolved. And there's no effort, as far as I can tell, by either party to seriously eradicate them. And that's problematic. You write about um, the Jeremiah Wright moment mm. during the um, 2008 presidential campaign. And part of what you write um, is, is this quote, what were we supposed to say? Were we supposed to deny the horrific history and ugly reality of racism to make white people feel more comfortable with their privilege? our criticism of our country made us no less patriotic. In fact, it made me proud to know that my ancestors in the face of white supremacist opposition had been fighting for generations to make America live up to its promise. And I, I you know, I had dog-eared that page because I was like, oh, here's the moment when he becomes the Donna Brazil who he, uh -huh. um, you know, who, who, who you'd seen, you know, previously and, and that, that willingness to say, um, to say directly to power the things it does not want to hear. Did we miss an opportunity? Um, and I don't mean so much President Obama himself, but black communities who were often seeking to protect the president from, um, the, from being as embattled as he was, did we, did we somehow miss an opportunity or were we just doing the best we could during those eight years to mm. really say to white folks the things they needed to hear? or that we needed them to hear? I think we did miss an opportunity. You know, one of the things I liked about writing this book is that it gave me a chance to reflect on my own sort of culpability and participation over the course of the past few decades, from the Clinton administration to supporting President Obama. At the end of my chapter on Clinton, I think I, 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 I say something along the lines of, um, uh, at the time in the 90s, it seemed that he was the best we could do, but looking back in hindsight, it seems we were wrong. Um, and, and I reevaluate Barack Obama, too, particularly uh, given the fact that I was I disagreed with Obama on a number of issues. And I said so from time to time. But I think I was also uh, guilty, as were many other people, of not pushing him as hard as he could have been pushed. Um, and part of that is because he was a black president. And my assumption was, well, you know, he can't be any worse than all the white presidents we had before. But he had this opportunity for eight years to try to move the country forward. And I think at the time it seemed unrealistic for some people to think, oh, a president can't really do all those things. He'd be widely criticized. But then Trump comes in for four years and does anything he wants and doesn't stop until the courts or somebody tells him not to do it. And it, it reminds me of just how often Obama missed those opportunities. And I, again, I know it's not just about Obama, but, but I, I think, for example, about the Supreme Court justice with Merrick Garland. I was saying at that time, I wish Obama had appointed a black woman to the Supreme Court instead of Merrick Garland. Uh, for a number of different reasons. But one, of course, would be to motivate black people to vote. To vote! Look, exactly. not Keith, not just a black woman, 
I have a, I have a whole white paper I wrote about what needed to happen in that moment was Joe Biden, then vice president needed to call Anita Hill. He needed to say, I'm sorry, I figured it out. We're gonna put you up for the nomination. We know that you may not get a vote, but this is what we, sh what we should have always done. You should have always been the nominee. And when I think about what black women would have done, if we had thought we could have put Anita Hill on the court by voting for Hillary Clinton, baby child, listen. Wow, yes, Melissa, that's brilliant. I, I have to see this paper. I've never never heard that. I I, I just thought it would be a good idea to put a point a black woman, but Anita Hill, that, that's a whole nother level. I think uh, Listen, that's a brilliant idea. We um, people, it would have, it would have, it would have inoculated Biden against what he then had to manage. And she actually also would be a damn good justice. Oh my God. And she'd be on the court with Clarence Thomas. <laughs> Good. Yes, exactly. Wow. I mean, what karma. I, that's the kind of thinking, though, I wish that the Obama people had done. I feel like they were so careful about drawing within the lines and making sure they dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and following all the protocol. And the Republicans didn't care about any of that. And even if he didn't get his appointment during the, the administ his administration, he could have made a recess, recess appointment. He could have used all the powers at his disposal. He, he could have actually, I, you know, I give credit for one thing Obama did, which is remarkable. He gave commutations to, I think, 1,927 different people. A large number of them were African-American people of color. Um, that's a significant number. I think more than the seven or eight presidents before him combined. But he could have done more. I mean, the one issue I remember, who was I having this? Was it with you recently? We were talking about about. Um, no, it was um, Bakari Sellers. We were having a conversation about marijuana last oh, week. Oh yeah. And what I was and, and, and Bakari was critic, criticizing Biden, rightfully so, for not doing more on on pushing for marijuana legalization or descheduling it from uh, drugs that are illegal and. I responded by saying, well, Bakari, the real person we should be mad at is Barack Obama. I mean, Joe Biden is from a different generation. He doesn't even understand why marijuana is not dangerous. But Barack Obama is from a generation who, who smoked marijuana. He talked about it publicly and used other drugs. He, read, he talked about it in his memoir. He's the one who could have been the president to push on that issue. But the Democratic Party didn't do it, that Barack Obama didn't do it. The party was so focused on catering to this, this elusive white middle America, mid, middle class or middle income voter that they forgot about the people who elected them. The base of the Democratic Party, the most loyal constituency of the Democratic Party are black people. I keep going back and forth about whether or not I think it is a, a catering to, right, to these voters who you know, mythical sort of white moderate voters who they're never going to get, right? That's like my, that's my most harsh assessment, um, not only of the Obama years, but of the party more generally. My more generous assessment is um, that, that Barack Obama, before being President Barack Obama, is Professor Barack Obama, and that as a constitutional law professor, that he might actually be a true believer in the system, in the structures, a true believer that, um, that the ends do not in fact justify the means and that in fact it's the means that always sort of uh, make us have to live with the ends, right? That you have to use these particular rules to get there. I don't know him personally well enough to know, you know whether I should be giving the more generous or the least generous read, but I do know that, that, in, that in the moment of crisis, so there's this, there's a 60 day moment, right? Because you can also say that clearly a lot of people were delusional. They believed that Hillary Clinton was gonna win the presidency, but there's a moment after the election and before the inauguration where it, you know who's coming next. <laughs> like Donald Trump is coming. So you, that's right, you, you do the last things that you can do because who cares about critique at that point? You, you got to go ahead and give amnesty to everybody on the DACA list because you told the DACA kids to come out of the shadows and then you're going to hand the list over to the Trump administration. Give them amnesty. Just do it like you can. And yeah, people will be mad, but who cares? They'll get mad about something else next week. 
I it's com- those it's those 60 days that I'm always most angry about. I completely agree. You know, it, it reminds me of my of something I did years ago, which I feel really bad about. Um, back when I was a college student, I was an editor of my a student newspaper at Dartmouth College, the editor in chief. And Dartmouth is an overwhelmingly white school. And I think everybody on the newspaper staff was white, to be honest, except for me. Maybe there was somebody else I can't remember, but actually there was there was a photography editor who was Asian American. But uh, for the most part, it was overwhelmingly white. And when I left, the editor who followed me was also white, a white man. Um, and I regret regretted later that I didn't figure out a way to use my power. It wasn't even aware of the fact that I could have or should have used my power mm-hmm. to try to recruit more black people to come and to work for the newspaper, to be a part of the staff, to, to even be editors at the newspaper. And I think that Obama, and a totally different level, you know, obviously what he was doing. I think that Obama, um, I think was so caught up in the, uh, the, 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 the trappings of what you were supposed to do as president, that he didn't see, he didn't seize the opportunity to take advantage to do something dramatically different from the norm. I mean, what was dramatically different about him was simply his skin color. That's but right, he just couldn't, being. exactly, his, his very presence in the White House was dramatically different. But he could have done something even more dramatic, just like you're saying with the, with the DACA amnesty or so many other examples where he just could have said, you know, especially after Trump was elected, um, we're not going to leave these people hanging. We're going to do everything we can to protect them. But instead, he, he gives this, this hopeful speech again about how we're all rooting for you, Donald Trump. No, I don't not. know anybody who is rooting for Donald Trump, except no, for Donald Trump and his supporters. <laughs> That's right. I wouldn't room for him. Not, I'm always rooting for my country. And I'll even say I, I continue to root for the soul of the Republican Party because I much prefer um, that there, are, there will always be more than one party. There will always be disagreement. And I'd like everybody to be good and healthy and committed to um, self-governance and democracy and the peaceful transfer of power. So in that sense, I'm rooting even for the soul of the Republican Party, but I'm not rooting for Donald Trump at any point. That's- no, Nor am I. Yeah. And, and well, and I, I get it. And I don't think Donald Trump is rooting for the country him either. He's only rooting for himself. But it's funny you say that because I had a conversation last week, I think it was with Michael Steele, former chair of the Republican Party. And oh, Michael. yeah. And the weird part about this conversation is that I remember, you know, there's part of the book, a part of my book where I encourage black people to join the Republican Party. Uh, which is odd because I'm a Democrat and have no intention of becoming a Republican. And Michael Steele disagreed with me. He told me, it's, wait, it's not worth your time. It's not worth their time. Don't do it. Don't encourage anybody to do it. And I asked him, well, are you still a Republican? And he said, yes. And I didn't understand, well, why are you still a Republican if you're telling other Black people not to be Republicans? My argument is they could go there and try to change the party. But he says it's too late. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I had a conversation that wasn't that different um, with him recently. And, you know, Michael, I've always just like liked Michael Steele as a, as a person, um, but we used to have far more policy disagreements. But it has been interesting. There are, there are many more Republicans who I think are Michael Steele-like in that, you know, clearly you know, he's, a, he's a devout Catholic who moved into the party initially because of a set of, you know, personal ethical beliefs um, and has seen those beliefs shredded by the Trump years, like absolutely, you know, all the things that he believed about family, about community, about, you know, goodness, like he genuinely believed those things and watching them shredded by the party. But honestly, I, my main thought was, yeah, well, I felt that way about Democrats many times um, and have felt that, wow, I, I feel like I was trying to be part of this party for these reasons and I'm watching it be shredded in this moment. Mm. Yeah, I I agree with you. It's it's sad to to watch that happen. I I the one of the perfect example I think about is where we are right now. Uh, I always go back to the issue of race and black people, but I, I still find it unacceptable that we have a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, a Democratic White House, and we can't pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, or the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. And we're falling on the, the tired excuse of, we can't get it passed because of the filibuster in 2021. And they expect Black people to turn out in the midterms in 2022 or for the reelection campaign in 2024 without any deliverables. Yep. All right, we're gonna do a 
one of my favorite things. This is called a speed round. Okay. So I'm just going to think of it as almost like those ink blot tests, you know, mm -hmm. like you see it and just say what comes to mind. Mm -hmm. So okay. brief answers. These are very big topics, far too complex for a speed round. But I just want to get your initial responses on them. So yes. we're just going to start right where you left off. The filibuster. Um, abolish it. Is, is that what you want or, or something? No, no I mean, yes, no, I mean, totally. I'll take it. I mean, you were like, yeah, no, that's got to go. I, I would go okay. for a, I would go for a compromise where you don't actually abolish it, but require a talking filibuster, or you have a, a cyclical filibuster where it goes down from sixty to fifty five to fifty one, depending on you know over time or something like that. But ultimately, it should not be able to stop progress forever. DC statehood. Um, it should happen as soon as possible, along with Puerto Rican statehood, if it's if that's what they want, which I think they do. Yeah, I think it's yeah. I mean, there's debate, but yes, I mean, yeah. let, let's debate within. Let's get four more senators, which would also help with the filibuster thing. Right. So um, again, big topic, but sort of first responses on it. it. Looks like Black folks may have been undercounted in the 2020 census. Thoughts. Sad, not surprising. And it's funny you say this because I saw this, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, it was very recently. Um, and I was thinking about writing an article about it, um, but I haven't yet done that. Um, it's, I don't even know where to begin on this one. It, it's, it's, this is, this is the reason, I, I think we're setting up a, a, the, the structures for a future apartheid state in our country. We're not there yet, obviously, because white people are still the majority of the country. But by 2044, there's a, there's a possibility that they, they will not be according to the census projections. And um, they have set up mechanisms in place to perpetuate their power, regardless of whether they have a majority. And as long as they have control over the state legislatures for redistricting, as long as they have control over the voting process and the state election boards, which have the power to overturn elections, as long as they have power over census, uh, census taking, which they did in the last year, um, as long as they have power over the judiciary, which they continue to do, even though Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections, as long as they have this disproportionate power in the United States Senate, where California with 39 million Senate, 39 million people only has two senators, but North Dakota and South Dakota with barely a couple of million have four senators. As long as they have this structural impediment that prevent the new emerging majority from, from actually uh, using the power that it is walking into, um, they're going to be able to hold on to power far longer than the, 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 the population demographics would suggest. So we're moving to even more of a, of a possible apartheid state than was even imaginable before. Now, mind you, in some respects, we already do have this because white men are only 29% of the population, but they're 98% of our presidents in the United States. But that's a long-winded answer. You asked for a short one, so I'm sorry for going on so long. No, no, I love it. Okay, not your preference, just your prediction. If we end up with a presidential face-off between Vice President Kamala Harris and former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, who do you think takes that one? That's a really good question. Um, I don't see Nikki Haley getting the nomination, obviously, from the, uh, from the Republican Party. But if she were, she'd have to make a number of uh, sort of backtracks in some of the statements that she's already said about Trump, which she's done to a certain ex extent. Um, I think maybe Kamala Harris might pull it out in a squeaker. That's, I, it's a tough one, though. That's a really good call. I don't know. Who do you think? Oh, I, yeah, I think Nikki Haley takes that one in a massive landslide. Really? Really? Interesting. Yes, we could talk about that later. But again, I don't necessarily, I don't think, well, I, there's a lot of reasons I don't think that matchup will ever happen, but I'm always interested in what we think would happen if we did have two women of color running against each other in the two major parties, both of whom have this national focus, what would that look like? Well, right. I, I, don't, I also don't think Kamala Harris is, is doing very well right now in terms of the way she's being positioned by the administration. And uh, I was just talking to a friend, an old White House friend today, about this whole controversy at Howard University where students are protesting about the housing conditions. And I was suggesting, I know it's not in her, proto, in her portfolio at all, I was suggesting she could make a few call, phone calls and get this thing resolved for the students and the, and the administration as a mediator on, you know, and 
and be a hero to everybody just by by getting engaged in that. But I don't think they're going to do that. But I I will try to be as quiet as I can about what I think is happening with vice presidential performance in this particular term. That said, relative to Howard, for those who have actually read the vice president's memoir, which I have because I'm a little obsessed with political memoirs. Howard is exactly one and a half pages. So maybe not that surprising that she's not making the call. Okay, so we'll just go on. So Dave Chappelle. Um, I almost don't wanna talk about Dave Chappelle but I also kind of feel like we have to. So we've been talking about this capacity to speak truth to power. We've been talking here a little bit about um, your moment with the FBI and thinking we'd already passed. Um, on the other hand, Dave Chappelle is not an elected official. He's a comedian. In this moment, have you had any gut level responses either to the actual show or to what's happened in the public conversation afterward? Well, I've been surprised by the amount of division on this issue, not just within the Black community, but within the Black uh, LGBTQ community. Um, and I personally have always been a fan of Dave Chappelle in the past, but I think that the idea of, of criticizing or making jokes of uh, people in the trans community, even for the purpose of, of making a comparison between the way the queer community is treated and the way black com the black community is treated is unnecessary. Um, and it, it fosters a hierarchy of, of, of oppression, which I don't think is helpful. Um, and it also, I think, you know, the old phrase, it punches down. You know, why are we, of all the things that are going on in the country today, why are we talking about this? Why is Dave Chappelle, I mean, we had an insurrection in our country. Uh, we, we have a, a, a president who wanted to be a fascist, who wanted to be a dictator in our country. Um, we have a, a pandemic that has killed 700,000 people. Uh, we have millions of people who lost their jobs last year. Uh, we have crisis after crisis after crisis, not to mention the fact that we still haven't resolved our racial justice issues in this country, the, the core racial justice, the criminal justice issues. So there's so much material to talk about. Why does Dave Chappelle keep talking about this? I don't understand it. That's the thing. And yes, I totally agree. He has every right to say whatever he wants. Okay. That's not, it's not a question about freedom of speech. It's a question about, to me, it's about, it just doesn't make any sense. Why is this even necessary? Um, and the response I got from people who I said that to was, it's his show. He has the right to do whatever he wants to. Wants to. Of course he does. I'm not denying that he has a right to say whatever he wants. But it just seems to me that people who have, I think people have mistakenly called him edgy or cutting edge because he's doing this. I don't think it takes, it, it's no cutting edge to me and a rich guy uh, criticizing um, or challenging a community of people who are traditionally marginalized. And people say, well, he's talking about white people, white queer people, not black queer people, but black trans women are the ones who are being killed or being murdered. Yes. Three dozen of them have been murdered this year. Yes. And many of them by black men. Yeah. So are we going to talk is, about that? Yep. Which is the painful part, right? That there, this is not just a matter of state violence, but absolutely of intra-community violence. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to ask some of the questions that have been asked um, on the uh, in the YouTube. So one is about COVID. Um, and uh, as you point out, <laughs> I think as all of us are kind of trying to emerge out of this um, moment in whatever ways that we can, I've gotten literally as many vaccines as anyone will give me. Like I just, I go to free vaccines and just wherever they give them out, I'm getting them. Both arms, both legs, give it to me and my knee, wherever. But as we're trying to come through this moment, do you have a sense that it will shape either the midterms or the 2024 presidential race? The vaccine issue, the COVID issue? Yeah, COVID in general. So whether oh, yeah. it is the fact that the Republicans had a president in charge while 700,000 Americans died um, or, or the, the continuing battle over masks and vaccines. Yeah, I, I do. It's definitely going to be... Uh, barring another insurrection or some other catastrophic event that happens in the next year, which is all very possible, um, it's definitely going to be an issue in the 2022 midterms and 2024 election. Um, there are some people who think that COVID won't be over for several years. And this is an era that we're in. It's not just a crisis. Uh, so that's possible. Um, and 
I'm, I'm not convinced that it cuts one way or the other, that it benefits Democrats or Republicans, because I think it depends on the particular jurisdiction or election that's going on and how people are framing it. Uh, we saw what happened in California, where originally there was a big backlash against Governor Gavin Newsom and led to the recall election. But uh, the fact they put Larry Elder up against him as an opponent uh, sort of responded to that. And, and so the question is, are, is the Republican Party going to be beholden to Trump, especially in those swing states? And if they are, I think they're going to miss a lot of opportunities where they could pick up seats because some people will be upset with some of the things that maybe the Democratic leaders have done. But if you if you put a Trump acolyte or a Trump uh, wannabe in in as a candidate, I don't think that serves the Republican Party very well. But they've made their bed now. They have to lie in it. And here's our last question. And I think in, in many ways, it's both a perfect reflection of the book, which sort of walks through your, um, uh, your trajectory as a, as a young po person in politics to um, the insights that you've had after being in multiple White House's administrations and in American political media. But what do you say to young people right now, particularly those who maybe their first vote they cast for the re-election of the first black president? And then they saw that turned back with President Trump. They went into the streets in the summer of 2020, um, saw some gains, but have seen many of those pulled back. How do we keep young folks in this country involved and engaged in the big project of self-governance? Well, that's an excellent question. And I'm glad we're ending there because it's an opportunity to talk about what things we can do to move forward. Uh, but first, I just want to thank you, Melissa, for doing this. Uh, I know you didn't have to do it. And I really appreciate you for taking time out of your busy life to do this. Um, and, and thanks to the Shabazz Center for having me here as well. Uh, but this has been a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And um, um, not a, not quite as interesting as the conversation we had last week over drinks, but but it was still a good oh, conversation. Good. Uh, yeah, this is just water. <laughs> this is just water. Same here. That's all I'm drinking. Uh, but um, you know, in answer to your question, I think that I'm not completely hopeless, um, and I think the answer for young people depends on what they do with the future. That they can't assume that the demographic changes or that the aging of America will, will ultimately re re result uh, in a changed, more progressive America. Um, I go back to a quote that I use often and I use in the book from Dr. King, where he warns us that time itself is neutral. It can be used constructively or destructively, he writes. And the reason why I say that is because we're at a, an inflection point where the next few months, if not the next few years, will determine what kind of country we're going to be. And it could very well pivot in a very negative direction and spiral out of control and cause some sort of conflict or catastrophe. I don't think that's out of bounds at all. But it could also move in the other direction. It could also move in a completely different direction, a more hopeful, more loving direction, more inclusive direction that changes things that haven't been changed and should have been changed for decades or centuries. And that depends on the actions of young people and the actions of activists and the actions of people who are progressive minded, if they don't give up, but they, they continue to have hope, they continue to fight for an America that they want to see. You know, I had this conversation last week with, with someone who was older, um, Lee Bailey from EUR Web. And um, I like Lee, I like what he does, uh, but I every, it was an interview and every time I suggested something, you know, all the ideas I put in the book, he was like, yeah, I just don't see it changing. I don't see white people changing. I don't see any of this changing. And, and I guess at the end of the conversation, I, I just had to say, well, what's the alternative? I mean, it, we can eat, we can all agree that things may not look good, but if the alternative is, is, is to do nothing, then we're resigning ourselves to the fate of catastrophe. I don't want to accept that as the alternative. I believe that we have the opportunity to be control in control of our own fate. And so I encourage those young people, uh, whether they're in high school or college or not in school at all, whatever uh, role they may play in life and society to be active and be engaged and fight for the country they want this to be. And don't let anybody take that away from you.
I love it. And again, that image on the cover of the young person looking forward, seeing um, both the aspirational possibility of the American project, even um, in reckoning with the um, uh, the realities of our history. And so um, everybody should be reading it, take it um, uh, in any form you can get it. There's an audio book, <laughs> there's the ebook. And of course, always my favorite is just the good old thing that you can dog ear and circle and <laughs> write in. That's I'm, I am old enough to like my books that way. Thank you so much for joining um, uh, this conversation, Keith. And thank you to the Shabazz Center for, um, for hosting both of us. Thank you to everyone.